So last week we started a discussion on the topic discernment. And as you know, that is one topic in the series of topics we've been talking about um, on churchy words that have a lot of meaning and depth, but that we use them so much Sometimes we forget how deep they really are, and sometimes we forget that people who don't go to church or haven't gone to church their whole lives don't know what we're talking about. And so we've been building sort of a foundation with an understanding of both these concepts and the meaning of these words. And we started with faith, and we moved on to salvation, and we talked about grace and, some, and worship, and I think I'm probably forgetting something, and we've moved on to discernment. And discernment is a word that people throw around, and you can use it obviously in a secular context, but a lot of people use it in church, and they say things like, Lord, give me discernment, or I have discerned, or let us have discernment together, etc. And we sort of know what it means if you just can look up the definition of the word. But in the spiritual context, what does it mean? And how deep does it go and how important is it or should it be to us? And last week we started the topic on discernment with a topic that most of us like to think about more than any other topic and that is ourselves. Right? So we talked about discernment as a form of self-assessment. How do we look internally and what is the perspective we should have on assessing ourselves? And we, ba we only just scratched the surface of that topic when we talked about the idea of having a plank in our own eye as opposed to a speck in our brother's eye. All right, so today we're going to look at discernment from another angle. Now, one thing I want to say before we get into the passage is many of you have probably heard of the spiritual gift called discerning of spirits. And it's a way of understanding in the spiritual realm what is going on in more detail. And I'm not going to get too far down that road with this series because that's more of a spiritual warfare kind of conversation. But I'll say this as it relates to discerning of spirits and then move on into what we want to talk about today. Discerning of spirits, the essence of that gift, the beginning point of that gift that every believer should be able to do or should be working toward, is the same as the essence of anything else that we want to be able to discern. And you don't have to get all weird about naming demons and doing all that kind of stuff that you see on TV or read about in books or whatever in order to be discerning of spirits. What we as believers need to be concerned with is our ability to know what is of God and what is not. And if we can make that dividing line as accurately as possible, we will be on an excellent track. If it's not of God, it doesn't matter that much whether it's a demon or whether it's you or whether it's your mother's old something in your head that won't shut up or whether it's a fear from something that happened in your past or some trauma or whatever. It could be any number of things that are telling you to do something or leading you in a direction that is away from the direction God wants you to go in. But what we need to be able to recognize as clearly as possible is that it's not of God. And it's great if over time we can sort of parse out all the other stuff because it helps us do the battle. It helps us overcome it. But the first step is being able to understand, is this God or is this not? And that is the essence of discernment. That's going to be the working definition that we have on this topic called discernment. We want discernment to be wisdom in action. And the wisdom of what is God and what is not God. And when you see this come into play, you will see just how crucial and important it is and how much we want to be able to do it more and more. So let's start reading at 1 Kings chapter 3. <clears throat> it says, Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took the Pharaoh's daughter and bought her, brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. 
The people were still sacrificing on the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given to him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have you asked for riches, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before, nor shall there be one like you after. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any kings like you in all of your days. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and a feast for all his servants. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and please help us to discern today what it is that we need to learn. Speak to each of our hearts. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to give you three things about discernment that we see in this passage, and then we're going to pick up next week and finish it off with rounding out the picture of what we learn about discernment in these scriptures. The first thing to note, as far as discernment and wisdom go, is that you need to ask for it. You need to ask for wisdom and discernment. This may seem obvious, except most people don't do it. Many of us think that in time, we will become more wise. But how many of you know that there are foolish old people as well as there are foolish young people? Why? Because some things we learn from experience, and if all goes well, we learn a few lessons the hard way, but then we are wiser and we pass that on to others. But how many of us know sometimes people don't learn their lesson, or the lesson they learn is totally different from the lesson that they should have learned, or the one that they should be passing on to anyone else. I remember many, many years ago, the Oprah Winfrey show, anybody remember that show? She had a guest on the show, he was a homeless man, and they wanted to do an experiment with this homeless man. So they plucked a random guy off the street. I think they tested him for drugs and for mental illness and things like that that would put him at an obvious disadvantage. And then they said, okay, young man, or whatever man he was, we want to help you out. We want to test whether your situation is just a coincidence or a product of circumstances or whether it's more a product of your choices. So they gave this man $100,000 with no strings attached. And they said, now go 
and do with it what you will. We hope that you'll make something of yourself. And the general idea that this, what this man did, or the, the, the high points were, or low points, he went and bought his dream pickup truck. I think he bought it used, but it was something like, it was over $30,000. And then he brought a friend of his who had been good to him over the years, a car for themselves, another car, right? It was a used car, but it was several thousand dollars. So right off the bat, he's almost halfway in. And then he went out and over a period of, a very short period of time, he more or less squandered everything he had and used some of the things he had as collateral to get debts. And he ended up not only having lost the $100,000, but in debt. So he was basically worse off than when he started. And he came onto the Oprah show and Oprah said to him, well, what have you learned? And the man said, I've learned not to trust the system. And Oprah was like, well, but the system gave you $100,000. What do you mean? His takeaway was that it was all rigged. And that the system had done him wrong in giving him this money and enticed him to go out and get himself into debt and now he's worse off. And everybody else looking at this was, no, the system tried to help you out and you chose to take what was given to you and do something foolish with it, which got you into trouble. Rather than seeking guidance or help or going slowly or getting yourself a place to live and some nice clothes and cleaning up and then getting a job so you could see all these things. Now, Oprah got a lot of criticism for that episode <laughs> because, first of all, it made the guy look bad and, you know, poor guy. He was minding his business and then he ends up on, you know, national TV. But also they said she set him up for failure because they should have given them, him the money and a financial advisor and a counselor and all these other resources. But he had the means to seek those things. It just wasn't on his mind to do. But the reason I bring up that story is here was a man who had what could have been a life changing experience where he could have shown what someone who, if given, a little bit of help, I mean $100,000 is kind of a lot of help, but given some help, could have turned his life around and could have possibly been very helpful to others in his former homeless community. And instead, he squandered it. But the lesson he took away was that it was all rigged, everybody's against him, he'll never trust anyone again. That's the wrong lesson. So life and experience and how we interpret life and our experiences and our trials and all those things can sometimes lead us to lessons that bring us wisdom. And sometimes they lead us to lessons that bring us foolishness. So we should not count on just growing older and learning the ways of the world. We should go to the Lord for our wisdom. Another point on this is that the things of the kingdom are not intuitive and they are not most of the time natural how many of us know sin feels really natural and most of the time when we say it feels natural what we mean is it makes us feel good and if sin doesn't feel good you're doing it wrong <laughs> because sin is often fun and it usually does at least in the moment feel like the natural thing to do but the way of the kingdom tells us to do something else. It is not intuitive to turn the other cheek. It is not intuitive to pray for our enemies. It is not intuitive to take a day off every week of rest so that we can be more productive the rest of the week. Doesn't it seem like the person who takes on the seventh day is always going to be ahead of the person who always forfeits the seventh day as a Sabbath, right? Doesn't that seem to be how the math would work out? And yet the kingdom, the principle of God tells us, if you work and then rest, work and then rest, your work will be blessed such that you will be more productive, or at least as productive as you need to be to accomplish the things that God wants you to accomplish. So the ways of the kingdom are not things that we naturally think of, nor are they things that all the time feel good or feel natural. We only know the ways of the kingdom because God gave us a manual to help us out. And he also gives us discernment and understanding on a case-by-case, moment-by-moment basis if we would be willing and interested to hear what he's saying.
So discernment is something that we have to pray for because the wisdom of God is not something we should assume we will naturally come upon on our own. In fact, we should assume the opposite. Now, I love this story, this Solomon, uh, story of Solomon receiving wisdom because you know the next scene is the split the baby scene, right? And we all know that. It's lovely. So women, two women have a baby. One of them dies overnight. And then the other one, and then they're fighting over who, who the living baby belongs to. And both of the women want to keep the baby that didn't die. And so they go before the king and they say, tell us who gets to have this baby. And Solomon in all of his new wisdom says, I have an idea. Give me a sword, I'll, call, I'll cut the baby in half. And you each can take half. And the woman, the, the, the woman who's, for whom the baby was really her child said, never mind, she can have the baby, just don't kill it. And the woman who didn't have the child, whose child had died, said, good idea. Cut the baby in half and then neither one of us will have it. And Solomon says, okay, well, now I know who really mothered the baby and she gets it. What a wonderful little trick in all of his wonderful wisdom. But this, this prayer that he had of God give me wisdom, comes. it's not a coincidence, obviously, that it comes just before a scene where he begins to exhibit the great wisdom that he has. It's also not a coincidence that this wise person wrote what we have as the greatest book of wisdom there ever was. And what is that? Proverbs. It's also not a coincidence that he wrote the most depressing book, aside from Lamentations, that we've ever had, and that is Ecclesiastes. Okay, we're going to come back to that shortly. All right, number two. So you need to ask for wisdom. You need to pray for discernment. You can't expect that you're going to come to it on your own or know what to do with it or know how to recognize it without God's help. Number two is you need to ask for it no matter where you are with God. Do not wait until the clouds have parted and you feel like you are in, in one union with God and you now understand all the rest. And now I will seek the Lord for wisdom. You need to ask right now. I think this, this story is so interesting, the way that it describes Solomon. It says he was, he, he, was, he was a good man, right? He was generally a good man, following in his father's footsteps. The only thing was he occasionally would worship at other temples and sacrifice to other gods. That's not good, is it? Most of us would look at that and go, isn't that like, doesn't that by definition make him not a good man? Like we think that the idea of sacrificing to an idol is about as bad as it gets. Doesn't it violate like the first commandment? And yet he was given a pass as being, you know, not too bad. And the people of God also worshipped at these high places. And the high places are just a name for this sort of sacrificial, like, altarish thing that they had in ancient times. Um, and they would worship other gods there. A lot of people think that that's what the Tower of Babel actually was. It's just a very large one of those. But in any event, they would worship these high places, these temples, and why? Well, because their temple hadn't been built yet. So why not? We'll just go where the other people are going. Most of us look at that and we go, that doesn't make any sense. That seems like that's pretty much a cardinal sin if there ever was one. And yet God not only says he's not so bad, but he also has so much favor and grace on him that he grants him this wisdom that the world has never known, had never known, and has, hasn't known since. What does that tell us? It tells us that no matter where we are, and what we are up to and how bad we've been or how far from God we might be, we need to be seeking the Lord and his wisdom right now. And it's interesting because it says Solomon, Solomon went to this place to worship because that was the most major, largest, biggest deal temple. But after his dream, what does it say that he did? It says he went back to Jerusalem and he sacrificed before the Ark of the Covenant. That was the symbol of God's presence. So even in that moment, he was able to turn around and go do something in a better way. 
We need to be praying for wisdom all along the way, no matter what we are up to. So many of us hide from God when we think he's distant from us because of whatever our sin, our circumstances, where we are currently. Some of us hide from God because we don't want to know what he has to say about the situation, but that's a different conversation. If you want to know what God has to say about something, don't wait to approach him until you feel like you've gotten yourself together. Because the trick is you probably don't know how to get yourself together until you ask God. It seemed perfectly reasonable to Solomon to go offer a thousand sacrifices at the altar of an idol, of a false god, until God gave him wisdom to do otherwise. All right, number three, you should, we should seek wisdom and discernment above all else. Solomon asked for the ability to discern good from evil when he could have asked for anything under the sun. Now, if you're like me, you're going to try to hack the system. You're going to say, I get it now. So I don't ask the Lord for riches and glory. I ask for wisdom. And then when I ask for wisdom, he will throw in the riches and glory. But that doesn't act. That's not actually how it works. The reason this was such a major deal is because Solomon at least had the presence of mind or the wisdom to know that all the other stuff is worthless if you don't have the wisdom to go with it. How many of us know that riches and glory can take you out as fast and sometimes faster as anything else? I watched Aladdin with the kids yesterday for Victoria's birthday, the live action one with Will Smith in it. And the, they added this part because it's not in the cartoon. So Will Smith comes out and he says, you've got three wishes, but here are the rules. Can't make anybody fall in love with you and you can't ask for more wish wishes. And then he throws in there as a bonus. And by the way, don't ask for money and power because it never gets you anywhere. Everybody asks for the same thing and I've seen it enough times to know it's not really gonna help you. And sure enough, that's what people do anyway, of course. But the idea here is that money, power, glory, all the rest of it, all the things that we seek cannot fulfill us ultimately unless we know how to keep them into perspective. When we lose perspective on what's really important, then we start to need these things and when the things don't work out, or something goes wrong, or we get rejected, or we lose our fame, or we fall from glory, or we go bankrupt, or whatever it is, that, what do we feel like? We feel like we have nothing left. And then life is meaningless. And what does Solomon say? What is the whole point of Ecclesiastes? All is vanity, right? The point of Ecclesiastes is it's all worthless. Money, fame, power, glory, women, beauty, everything that you spend your life seeking after is all vanity. It blows away like a piece of grass. It burns like a piece of wheat in the fire. It's worthless. It's meaningless. There is no point. And what's the conclusion? The fear of the Lord, right, is the only thing that has value. Spend your life pursuing God, and you will have a life that is meaningful. Spend your life pursuing literally anything else, and you will end up on your deathbed with the same conclusion. It was all meaningless. And that is coming from the most wise man that's ever lived and ever will live. And we have a challenge on Proverbs uh, at the end, so we'll come back to that. But we should be seeking wisdom and discernment above all else. We need to know what's right and what's wrong. We need to know what's good and what's evil. When we want to, so, so here's, a, here's an exercise. Scripture tells us to pray for our enemies. Most of us don't want to pray for our enemies. We want to smite our enemies. <clears throat> well, we're not allowed to do that if we're following what God wants us to do. But how do you pray for somebody that you really don't have good feelings to? I don't mean this person well, <laughs> right? So how can I pray for them in earnesty? Well, here is a prayer. Ask the Lord for discernment in judgment. 
God praises Solomon for saying, you have asked for discernment in seeking justice. Now it was especially important for the king because the king is the one that deals out justice. So he didn't want to just be acting out of vengeance. He wanted to be acting out of true justice and he knew that only God had the key to that. So he said, help me understand. But in our own lives, pray for that. If you don't know what to pray for or how to pray for something because you don't really want to pray for it, then ask the Lord for good judgment. And then ask him to help you want to pray for the best for someone whom you don't actually want the best for. And if you know, if, if you're thinking, well, there's, you know, I, I've never known someone I didn't really want the best for, then you've never really had an enemy. Because there are people who can hurt us so badly that it's hard to want anything good for them. What we really want is their comeuppance. But we need to pray for better understanding and for the heart to want the best for them. And sometimes, here's the trick, sometimes the best for someone is God's judgment. Because there's nothing that puts someone in line better and faster than the judgment that only the Lord can deal out. So when we're praying for God's judgment on a situation, it might not be that he comes around and says, all is forgiven, all is well, be nice to each other. He might come around to that person and say, here's the judgment I'm giving you for what you've done unrepentantly. But then we haven't done it, the Lord has done it. When you don't know how to handle any particular situation, when you're in a tough spot, when you're having a hard time, when you're having a great time, when you have blessings, when you have extra money, when somebody drops $100,000 into your bank account, pray for the discernment on how to handle it. Because we can mishandle fortune as, just as well as we can mishandle our anger and our, our desire to be vengeful and all the rest of it. Right? So at every point along the way, we are praying for the discernment so that we know what is wise, what is good, what is evil, what is of God, and what is not of God. And we should desire this thing above all else. Before we ask God to give us another blessing and another provision and another thing that we think is going to make us happy, we should ask God for the wisdom to appropriately handle that thing if it's given to us. Because otherwise, we can go out there and make complete fools of ourselves with our blessings, just as well as we can make fools of ourselves with our own sin. Do you see? So we want to be a discerning people as individuals and collectively. We want to seek the wisdom of God and we want to put that in action. That is discernment. We want to know what is of God. We want to know what is not of God. And we want to act and react accordingly. And if you don't truly want that, then what have you done? You have made yourself the Lord of your own life. And that is what we call an idol. Right? You or your own happiness or your own feelings can become an idol even faster than a golden calf can be. And if it is your desire, if it is my desire to have my way above the way of God, as he's made it clear to me, then ultimately my desire is to be the Lord of myself. And that is, right, the original sin. Right? It is the pride that takes us out. As they say, the pride before the fall. All right, so that is the message for today. Discernment, wisdom, we want it. We want it now. We want it even though we don't have it all together. We want it even though it's going to tell us to do things we don't want to do and that are not intuitive. We want to seek the wisdom of the Lord the way that Solomon sought the wisdom of the Lord. And we want to see what wonderful things he can do in our lives when we seek that above all else. And we're going to come back to this next week. Your homework for this week is... Ask yourself, have you asked God or sought God for wisdom? Just have you ever done that? And if not, why not? Has it just not occurred to you? Are you afraid of what you might find out? Are you afraid that he won't give it to you? Number two. 
For the month of October, so starting October 1st, we are going to read one proverb every day. Okay, and the, how many proverbs are there? How many days in October are there? See what it did there? One proverb every day. This is actually something that I know some people do month in and month out. They read one proverb every day forever. And that's a wonderful thing to do. But we're going to start with October. Not one, not, when I say one proverb, I mean one chapter in Proverbs. I don't mean like one verse. I mean, you could spend a whole day on one verse, but I mean the whole chapter. We're going to read one chapter in Proverbs every day for the month of October, and we are going to be praying for understanding as we read. And there are some really practical things in the book of Proverbs. If, if we were to just spend, if, if God had only preserved the book of Proverbs and, and Christians just spent their lives trying to put that into practice, I mean... We, uh, how much we could get out, we could avoid so much trouble. And if anyone would know, it would be Solomon. Because he tried basically everything under the sun, and he had everything anyone could ever want. And he ended up with the greatest book of wisdom and the greatest warning against chasing the things of this world that we've ever seen. So. Ask yourself if you've ever talked to God about having wisdom, and if not, why not? Read one chapter in Proverbs every day this month, and then there will be another assignment that we'll send out with the announcements before the small group for small groups to discuss uh, together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the understanding of the very basic but very profound point that what we want to seek above all else we're not talking about um, salvation. We know that. But once we know you, God, we know that above all else, what we need to be seeking is understanding from your point of view of what is right, what is wrong, what is godly, what is ungodly. And we want that to be the way that we live our lives. So, Lord, we pray for wisdom. You said, those who ask for wisdom, you will give it to them because you are generous with the gift of wisdom. So we ask for that gift. And God, we pray that we have the courage to put that wisdom into practice, to discern moment to moment, circumstance to circumstance, what you are telling us to do, what you are telling us not to do, what you would have us say, and when you would have us be silent. Teach us to be a people that not only can discern your will, but can live it out. And Lord, let us reap all the rewards in terms of life and health and relationship and love and purpose that are available to those who seek and diligently follow you and forsake anything else along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.